Good morning, everyone. Gary hasn't had time to put his shirt on yet because it's early, but we'll forgive him for that once. <laughs> okay, the YouTube live stream is started, so that is ready to go. Okay, pay attention to your backgrounds and your mannerisms, folks. You're on TV, and our millions of loyal viewers are going to want to see your best side. In my case, that would be like this. <laughs> All right, it is nine o'clock. I'm going to call the meeting uh, to order. This is a meeting of the Dunn County Traffic Safety and Emergency Medical Services Committee. Rather than introduce everybody now, what I would like to do is when it's your turn to present, say your name, who you represent, what uh, agency you're with, so that our viewers can uh, can kind of identify you that way. Um, if you've watched any of these Zoom meetings, one of the things you know that as an observer, it's a little difficult to follow the action if somebody doesn't kind of identify the players and, and what you're doing. So if you do that when it's, uh, when it's your opportunity to speak, I would appreciate it. Um, also, uh, if you will uh, mute uh, your um, your computer or your laptop or iPad or anything until it's time uh, to speak, that usually helps to cut down those extraneous noises that can sometimes uh, get in the way of things. Um, Patty Kenny is going to take the role, but I've been informed that we do have a quorum uh, so the next order of business would be approval of the December 20th minutes. Uh, I would entertain a motion to do that. Gary Steen moves. And I forget the names. Rick seconds. Uh, there's a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the, um, of the, what meeting was that? December 20th, 2019. Anybody have any changes, corrections, suggestions to make? Seeing and hearing none, I will put it to a vote. Uh, don't forget to unmute. And then uh, all those in favor of the motion to accept the minutes, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you, folks. Uh, public comment. I don't see anybody as a member of the public here? Uh, probably not, so we will skip past that. And we will get to item number five on the agenda, which is the Traffic Safety Committee uh, reports. And by the way, uh, I just got done asking you to identify yourselves, and I failed to do so. I'm Jim Tripp. I'm on the Dunn County Board. I chair the Judiciary and Law Committee, which means that I'm also chairing this meeting as well. Uh, so I want to welcome our millions of loyal viewers and all of those of you who are participating. Uh, and uh, uh, I hope that in the near future, by December at least, when we meet, we can do this in person so I can have an opportunity to say hello personally. Um, but enough for me. Uh, item number five, starting with uh, DOT traffic engineer, uh, and that would be Chad. Chad, you want to take it away? Sure. Um, I'm Chad Hines. I'm... Um... The DOT traffic engineer. Um, I guess I'll get started by going through our the status of our construction projects that we got going right now. Um, the first project is 94, um, the Nap Hill project. Right now we're working on the, the eastbound reconstruction up top of the hill. Um, they started concrete paving, so we got some good progress going on that. We're anticipating having eastbound traffic back on the original alignment by August 21st. Um, we've started work on the hill. Um, as you've probably seen traveling through there, we've got a lot of dirt getting moved and stuff. We're getting our, our temporary roads and stuff built. Um, we were originally going to switch traffic to start work on that after Memorial or after Labor Day, but we've, we're kind of advancing things and trying to get, uh, get the work started a little bit earlier because it's going to be quite the undertaking to get that done in a, in a really short amount of time here. So we're looking at July 6th. Uh, possibly switching traffic into what we're going to call our our three plus one lane configuration. So instead of building two complete temporary lanes like we did up top and you know on on the bottom toward Menominee, we're going to build an extra lane 
on each side. So to start here, we'll have two eastbound lanes and one westbound lane on the eastbound side. And then we'll still have an extra westbound lane going up the, the westbound hill. So during our, our peak hours, we'll have two lanes open in each direction. Um, but we're going to have a, a, a pretty narrow, basically what we call a cattle shoot design going up through there, one lane with concrete barrier on each side. So that's going to be a, a, a little bit challenging for traffic here. So hopefully, hopefully things go well and um, we still got our decreased volumes out on 94. So we're, we're hopeful that kind of continues and will will help uh, help us get through that. So we're anticipating eight weeks to do do the westbound side and then another eight weeks to do the eastbound side. So that'll take us into fall, um, looking at a, a November completion on that. Um, what we've done in the past, as far as some of these major stage changes and stuff is we've held an in-person emergency management meeting. So we're just kind of tossing around some ideas here on, on what to do for, for outreach to the emergency management folks leading up to this, this big traffic switch here. So um, if you guys got any suggestions, we'd appreciate that. I don't know if we want to do a, a Zoom meeting like this or, or, or what we kind of want to do. We can come back to that. Um, continuing on construction, Highway 72, the Old Galley River Bridge is still on schedule. Um, it's still detoured, looking at having that wrapped up by the end of August. Highway 25 from the South County line to the Red Cedar River resurfacing project. That was bid here back in May, and we're looking at probably starting sometime after July 4th. We don't have a schedule yet from the contractor. Um, we're going to be realigning the, the tight curves in between the two Ys, basically. And then we will have a short, I think, two or three day detour for some deep culvert replacements. Um, that detour is going to run up D through a galley and up to 72. Uh, that project has a November 1st completion date. Um, next project, Highway 1229 from B to 94 resurfacing that was just bid here in June. So we're anticipating starting that sometime in August and that will go into November. Um, we put out the Highway 85 Rock Creek Bridge in Rock Falls to bid here back in May, but our bids came in quite high. So we rejected it and we're gonna push that out to 2021 and see if we can get a, a little bit um, a better bid on that project. Um, that's it for construction. Uh, a couple traffic things. Scott, um, since we didn't have our meeting in March, are we going to talk about that 85 and old fatal? Yeah, I was going to bring it up uh, if I didn't hear you talk about it. Okay, uh, I'll see you, what you looked into on that. Do you want to wait and cover it then or, or do you no. want to do it now? No, go, go ahead. Um, yeah, so back in February, we hit, we had a fatal crash at Highway 85 and old. Um, and we had gotten a request from the township of Peru that went through Warren Petrick's office and, and uh, they asked us to do a safety study of that intersection to see if, if we could do anything there. And uh, the results of that were we looked at what it would take to lower the profile of Highway 85 and get some better sight distance for that intersection. And um, it's going to be, it's quite spendy. It's, you know, well over a million dollars to, to lower that profile and do that work. And when we're looking at qualifying for safety funds to fund a, an improvement like that, we don't have the crash history at this intersection to help us get, you know, a better value for, our, for that, um, for that work. So we've, we've held off on doing any major work at this time. Um, but to help address the crash that just happened here, um, we worked with the county. They've installed the yellow um, reflective stripe on their stop ahead sign posts. And then we've also doubled up the stop signs at the intersection. Um, I've, I've been in contact with David Bach and from the town of Peru and we've been um, keeping them up to date and, and uh, they're pretty understandable what's going on and, and understand the situation that we're in. Um, so we'll just continue to keep monitoring that 
that intersection and and uh, if things change, we'll we'll be ready to you know take another look at it. Chad, would there be any possibility rumble strips, or was that evaluated? Because this driver that went past the stop sign, basically, in his view, spaced it out. He drives this a lot, and we've had. I've been there. I think that's the first fatal we've had that I'm aware of. But we've had multiple crashes there. Um, I'm just wondering if the rumble strips would be a viable option there. They probably would be. I guess that would be up to the, the county to to look at doing that. Um, I think we only had one or maybe two crashes that involved the stop sign running, and I think we only had five crashes total yeah. in, in the last five years. So, you know, relatively speaking, it's a, it's a fairly, you know, safe intersection, except for when we do have a crash, it's, you know, it can be... Uh, a little bit worse than that so um i guess i could we could talk to john you know john and i could talk and see if if we think that's something to consider or okay, if you that good. um anything else you want to talk on that scott or you want to wait till you go through your fatal no that's fine i'll just give some more details on it but uh so long as you guys really had looked it over that's all we were looking for since the town board took some action to be concerned about it anyway oh and then uh, the last thing i got here is is we got design um underway on the highway 1229 project in menominee from 6th street to 21st street with the the road diet that's hmm, kind of a little bit controversial here depending on uh on which side of the, of the fence you're on um, basically, we're taking the, the four lane down to a three lane with a center turn lane, two way left turn lane, adding some pedestrian crossings and stuff like that. Um, we plan on doing some public outreach here and having a local officials meeting sometime later this summer. We'll kind of see what uh, what the environment's like here, if we can do something in person or, or how we're going to handle that just to make sure that we're we're getting out to everybody. So that's getting underway and, and uh, everything goes as planned. We're looking at a 2022 construction. So this will be a, a pretty quick turnaround on this project. So that's all I have. If anybody has any questions. Yeah, Gary. Uh, yeah, Chad, uh, regarding the Highway 25 redo uh, south of Menominee, there, there was some discussion on those curves down by Abbott's farm, uh, purchasing some additional land and putting some windbreak in there tree planting and stuff. Uh, is anything being done on that or, or where do we stand on that? Yeah, we're we're um, flattening out those curves a little bit in between there. And we're also putting in um, some plantings to help with the, the snow drifting and stuff across the road, so. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Chad. Any other questions? If not, we're gonna move along to uh, item B, DOT law enforcement. Uh, good morning, Rick Oleg here. I'm going to try and share my screen. I've never done this before, so I think I should just have to click share screen, but and I got to find which one I want to show, I guess, here, where to go. I think the host has to allow you to, oh, there you go. Okay, can you see that? Yep. Okay. Here's the... Uh, statewide fatality report. It's yesterday's report. They usually don't come up with the report till the afternoon. So uh, as you can see, we're a little <clears throat> behind last year's numbers, which is good. 185 fatal crashes uh, compared to 196 at the same time last year. And 205 people killed, 212 last year. Uh, I should mention that I did send a PDF version of this about 10 minutes before the meeting to everyone that was on the, the initial email list. Uh, second thing is the governor's conference on highway safety has been canceled. Uh, if you registered, you should be getting uh, the reimbursement. They're working through that process now. Uh, that also means, Scott, that the law enforcement luncheon is canceled. I don't know if you guys signed up for that or normally attended, but it's been canceled for now. I don't know what they're going to do to replace it yet. <clears throat> the community maps, um, to access it, what we have been telling people in the past is, um, just Google Community Maps Wisconsin. Well, what they did is created a 
I don't know what they call it, but basically a new address for it. And it's communitymaps.wi.gov. Uh, makes it a little easier for, you know, rather than putting that real long transportal dot whatever, just makes it a little bit easier and gets you to the same site. Um, there's also a link on the TSC resources uh, page that allows you to uh, set it up so that if you were to put this on your website, uh, you know, whether it's the sheriff's office or the counties or the health department or highway, uh, when they click on it, instead of them having to go through and pick the county and all that, it would automatically show your county. Uh, they only see the public side, which is the search side. They don't get to see the details, but we do see there's more and more people that are using the, the public side of it. Uh, a couple other things. One is uh, when we've looked at the maps, sometimes you see just a cluster of dots everywhere and one I'm gonna show you in a little bit. Um, you really can't tell. And even when you drill down to an intersection, you'll just see a pile of dots and you really can't tell whether there's one crash or five and they're all stacked on top of each other. Uh, so in the upper left hand part of the map under the advanced, you can click on that little uh, cluster and it'll bring up something like this that'll show you the, the numbers. And then as you zoom in, that'll keep parsing out more and more. Um, and it's a lot easier to look at this map and see where your, your numbers are. Um, and the one I'm showing on here is Washington County. It's just a part of this PowerPoint is when I use it all the counties, but you can kind of see, you know, like if you looked at West Bend, there'd be just one, one big blob where well, you can see they got 71 crashes. And then as you parse into it, it'll break it down. So it does make it a little bit easier when you're looking at various intersections. Uh, and other changes on the advanced tab, uh, you have the ability to go down and select the law enforcement agency that, that created the crash report. Uh, some agencies use it to, uh, you know, maybe a municipality will come to them and say, how many crash reports is the sheriff writing in our community because we're a part-time uh, law enforcement agency or uh, Milwaukee uses it because they want to know what crash reports happen in the city of Milwaukee that are taken by Milwaukee PD. Because in their case, they don't really, I, I shouldn't say they don't care about, but they don't factor in crashes on the interstate. And there's really no way to remove that from community maps unless you pick by agency. Uh, so for here, let's say uh, you could look at the interstate and say, you know, the sheriff seems to be taking a lot of crash reports out there. How many do we really take? Uh, so you could pick the sheriff and then section out the interstate and say, well, we're taking X number of crashes. Uh, next one here is the mobilizations. Uh, Clicker to ticket was moved from Memorial Day to uh, the 4th of July weekend. If agencies haven't signed up, you still have time to do that. That's a good way to be able to win $4,000 and it doesn't matter the size of your agency. Um, the one man agency can sign up for this and they can win. Uh, it's all about, you know, doing the enforcement during that time frame. There's no overtime involved. It's nothing really extra. It's just a matter of the, the officers or deputies that are out there working, um, document the things through, uh, through badger tracks and you run a report and it'll tell you the information you need for the, literally one line report that you submit. Uh, the rest of them currently are staying the same. We don't know what will happen with the August one. I assume it'll probably stay there. Uh, but again, it depends on what happens with the COVID-19 stuff. Highway safety plan, there was an email sent out a while ago uh, asking people to take this survey. Um, it is still open. They're still working on the highway safety plan and they're asking uh, everyone that can to fill it out. Uh, it's fairly, fairly simple. Basically, you'll click on it and it's, it wants you to tell us among a list of things, what are the top priorities that you see, such as distracted driving or speed or pedestrian crashes, et cetera. And then basically, what do you think we could do to fix that? Uh, that's kind of the, the simplified version of it, but uh, that's kind of the, the gist of it. It's used by uh, not only us, but it's used extensively by engineering uh, and they're in fact, I think they were the first ones to send us out to most agencies. And then if you want to see the current plan, you can click on the link on the lower part. Uh, 
Okay, then I ran some numbers through June 1st, and these are anything that was in as of Monday um, that happened through June 1st, comparing last year to this year. As you can see, the fatals are down uh, three compared to five last year. The A injury crashes are down, B is down, C is down, property damage. I mean, overall, the crashes are almost half. And I think a lot of that is because the vehicle miles traveled are down quite a bit. Um, we've kind of seen that trend almost statewide, except in the, the highly populated areas. Um, and some of it does have to do with construction that's going on. Um, and then on the lower part here, you can see the, uh, the, the factors in the crashes. Uh, you can see last year we had uh, 154 of those crashes were speed related. This year it's less than half, which is well under um, the percentage of, of crashes that diminished. Uh, that's actually a little bit unusual. We've seen uh, statewide where it seems like the speed related crashes go up when the traffic counts go down. Uh, one of the counties I was at last week said, uh, I think it was in one week, they had three or four uh, traffic stops, just the sheriff did on 100 plus miles an hour on the highway. Uh, and that's something that they don't see that often. I know the state patrol had some, some uh, incidents like that also. You can see the rest of the numbers, you know, drop a little bit, but distracted actually went up. Less crashes, less cars on the road, but the distracted. Some of that, I think, is our um, educational law enforcement and the, the kind of cleaning up of, of how the crash report documents distracted. Uh, alcohol and drug is about half. So, you know, the numbers have dropped quite a bit in most of the categories. Uh, and then I did a real quick map on the fatalities. There's three of them, which I believe Scott's going to talk about a little bit later. And then again, showing you the difference between the, the, all the little dots and the clustering. And we can look at the, it's the exact same data on both maps, but it's much easier to be able to look at the one on the right um, to kind of show you where the numbers are uh, and show you that, you know, maybe Downsville, if you look at it, it looks like, okay, there's maybe three or four when in fact there's eight based on, you know, clusters on top of each other. Um, as far as mapping the crashes, and that's a that's a critical thing. Um, if they're not mapped, they don't show up there and, and it's really difficult to be able to use them for both engineering or any law enforcement stuff. And as you can see, um, you know, there's only five crashes this year that haven't been mapped. And uh, if I remember correctly, I don't believe any of them were serious injury or fatal. So county continues, countywide, not just the county, but all the agencies, state patrol, continue to, to get much better at mapping. And it's this is probably one of the, the highest counties that I have um, as far as percentage of crashes that are mapped. Um, and then just looking at the locations again, you can see, you know, the interstate last year was just a pile full of crashes and it's a little bit less this year. Seems like it's it's broken down a little less. Um, I don't know if that's what you're actually seeing out there, but um, you know there were three fatalities and 64 injuries, which is about half of what you had last year. And then looking at the speed factors, um, a little interesting that last year it seems like the majority of the issues were in Menominee and on the interstate. And now it looks like it's a little more sporadic and maybe a few more on, what is that, Highway 25. Um, again, we're looking at less than half the numbers, but. Um, and then I looked at the seatbelt, roughly about the same locations of the, the seatbelt, um, which can help if, you, if you're gonna do seatbelt enforcement. Looking at this, obviously around the Manami area is, is where most of the crashes occur where they're not using a seatbelt. And then I just looked at uh, the predictive analytics side and said, okay, where can we expect to see crashes in the next 90 days? Uh, it'll give you the top five areas. Um, and you can kind of see through the box, you can see the, the green somewhat dots. That's the locations they're talking about. So extra enforcement on the interstate, uh, 
but then I'll, you can also see there's a couple other spots and then the, obviously the center of Menominee again. Uh, and then where are we gonna see the speed issues? It seems like the interstate on both the east and west side, uh, as well as uh, looks like around the Tainter Lake area and Highway 170. Just gives law enforcement an idea of, you know, where should we deploy an extra deputy if they have time or, you know, where should we direct them to go based on past uh, crashes. And the last three things I have are, I take each fatality and look at where it took place and then uh, using community maps, to see if there's been any other crashes in there in the past five years. Um, the first one on February 2nd, there's been the, the one fatality this year on the curve. It doesn't look like there's been any other one except one quite a ways west of there. And, uh, so the five year history is, is pretty low for that one. Uh, the one on Highway 85, community map shows four crashes. Uh, at that intersection, but again, I didn't pull the crash reports themselves to look and see exactly what happened. It just, this gives us a, I guess you call it a quick and dirty view. There's four in that area. Now, if you looked at it with just the dots, it would look like one crash. So that's where the clustering is nice. And then on the left, you can see the crash reports they're talking about. Um, and then the last one was the one on, uh, on, Highway W by the church. Again, there, there's been one, uh, the one fatality on March 18th. And then there was a, a crash a little bit south of there back on uh, October 11th, but it was no injuries. So there's not a significant history really at any of these locations that I could find. That is all I have. Now I've got to figure out how to get my screen back. Thank you, Rick. Does anybody have questions for Rick at this point? Uh, and I, you'll have to say something if you do, because I can't see on the screen. I don't hear anything, though. Um, so thanks, Rick. And, and we should proceed on to uh, C railroad, but I don't remember seeing Mike Marks. Is Mike here or somebody from railroads here now? And again, you have to speak up because I can't see your pictures on the screen. Don't Rick figures out how to get rid of his uh, screen sharing. Does anybody know how to how to change that? I bet Krista does. Is she still here? I am here. You just um, go up to the top of your your screen and it'll say it'll be like your live screening and then you click the view options you can stop I can also do it for you yeah because I don't see that I, I have a there we go oh, there, there we go. go thank you Krista thanks Rick You're welcome. Um, and nobody here from railroad right um, highway safety coordinator Scott that would be you Yep, Scott McRoberts, Dunn County Sheriff's Office. Um, I'll run through our crash info, which matches what Rick had kind of talked about, um, other than just some time frame issues. Uh, my information is just this year through the June 8th. Um, we currently have 79 crashes, um, way down, as Rick had noted. Uh, this time at during 2019, we had 153. So COVID, I think, certainly has reduced some traffic volume. Um, just a breakdown, we only handled one, and this is Sheriff's Office uh, crash reports that we, we investigate and handle. So we had one, one car deer that we actually handled and it was a squad related crash. So 24 multi-vehicle crashes, 55 single vehicle crashes, uh, 21 crashes with injuries and a total of 22 injuries in those crashes. The Sheriff's Office handled two of the fatals and the State Patrol handled one. They handled one up on County W. Just a rundown on the fatals on the 2nd of February, 8.23 p.m. Single vehicle southbound on 420th Street, south of Irvington in the town of Menominee. Excessive speed into the corner uh, vehicle, which was a Dodge Neon, left the roadway and struck a tree. A uh, 19 year old male operator pronounced dead at the scene, male passenger injured. No alcohol involvement on that. Uh, speed was the main factor and both were wearing seat belts. Um, I, I just throw it out there. Anybody got questions on that one at all? 
Okay. Then on the 20th of February, 548 AM was the Highway 85 and County Old West crash in the town of Peru. Um, that was a northbound Ford Explorer on County O approaching the stop sign at Highway 85. Um, the driver did not even recognize the st that stop sign travels the area quite often. Um, struck a westbound Honda Civic. 54-year-old um, male operator in the Civic was pronounced dead at the scene. No alcohol involved uh, with either driver. Um, both operators were wearing seat belts. Right now that case is in the DA's office um, for determination of what they want to do regarding the surviving operator that was northbound in County O and went through the stop sign. Um, and as noted by Chad Hines, we received a letter from the town of Peru. So we got in touch with Chad um, regarding their declaration of that intersection as a, a dangerous intersection. So I appreciate what the state did on looking at that. I think if uh, Chad and I talk with John, just uh, I don't know what the viability of rumble strips would be. They almost seem to me like possibly a good option. Uh, might have prevented this one potentially. Um, this guy was just kind of driving complacently and maybe that would have, you know, caught his attention enough to get stopped. Any questions on that one? All right. March 18th, um, we got a call at 525 AM. We don't know exactly how long this vehicle was in the ditch, but it was the County W fatal north of Colfax in the town of Grant just north of County S. 21 year old female driver northbound um, with a Jeep Patriot struck the curb on a bridge deck on the east side of the bridge deck. So she's northbound and veered uh, to, the, to her right and struck that curb and then veered back left of center, entered the west ditch and struck a tree. Uh, unrestrained, uh, pronounced dead at the scene. Alcohol 0.168 um, was a lone occupant in that vehicle. So we didn't see any road issues or any problems there. Uh, impaired driving was the contributing circumstance there. We are participating in clicker tickets starting here June 22nd through July 5th. We are registered for that, which makes us eligible for the equipment drawing. Um, we are currently participating in a speed enforcement grant. $30,000 has been awarded to the Dunn County uh, participating agencies uh, that want to uh, tag on with that enforcement campaign. So it's the Dunn County Sheriff's Office, Boyceville, Colfax, and Elk Mountain PDs. Um, we'll look to spend that money during the months of June, July, August, and September focusing on speed enforcement and looking at those areas Rick actually talked about. So um, we've, we've got three deployments done. One, we had one yesterday. So We'll continue to do that through the month of September. That's all I've got. If anyone's got any questions. Anyone, any questions for uh, Scott? I uh, don't see any. Thank you, Scott. And up next is uh, Highway Department, John Swarski. John, you with us? Yes, I am. Uh, first thing I have on my list is uh, we were awarded a uh, 9010 uh, funding on a HRRR, which is High Risk Rural Road Project on County Trunk Highway B from Highway 25 by Tractor Central back out to 12. Basically, it's uh, safety enhancements and improvements. It's 90-10 money, so our share is going to be right around 25, 26,000, and the balance will come from the state and the feds. Uh, we did recently just select KL Engineering here in Menominee to come up with the plans. We anticipate construction. It's going to entail rumble strips, uh, pavement markings, widening some shoulders, uh, improving some slopes, and then there's a couple guys out there for utility poles uh, to be moved back. So that one is going to go next year. Um, it, it's a heavily traveled road and especially if anything happens on the interstate, a lot of people like to use that as a cut across, especially the locals. Um, we are in the process of getting the plans done on County Trunk Highway B south from the interstate to 1229. Uh, that's in the design phase right now. 
And in February, we were awarded a million dollars in the MLS for the grant on B North, which would go from the interstate to a thousand feet north of the railroad tracks. So um, we're coordinating with the railroads. It looks like we're going to get signals at the railroads. We're going to get signal lights at that intersection by the two truck stops. And in the next year or two, that should get constructed. Constructed. Uh, that's going to cover about half. I think 46% is what it kind of pencils out with our preliminary estimate. 2.6 million is what we anticipate total construction costs there on. On the county system there, we've been working on county trunk Q just south of 64 here for about the last month and a half. Uh, this week we started the first phase of county trunk V east of Ridgeland. Um, next three years, we're going to do about four, four and a half miles a piece um, running through Sand Creek um, direction to the east. Uh, our chip sealing is scheduled to start here the week after the 4th, so should uh, expect a lot of phone calls on cracked windshields and windshield replacement. So par for the course there. After we get the chip sealing done, we're going to start our pavement marking and striping. So just uh, normal maintenance stuff after that. Any questions? Yeah, John, Scott here. Um, what about County Z? What's the plan on County Z, Townable Galley, uh, Western Dunn? That got postponed. The first segment of that, that's a three segment uh, phasing also. That'll get start next year and then should roll out for the two consecutive years after that. I'm just trying to keep the locals calm. <laughs> it's, uh, it, we must be up to 46 or 47 years since we've been in the area doing construction. Because when I got here, it was like 43. So all the, all the locals keep me informed. You can see the history of the pothole patching there. Yes. And and Z is terrible. There's, there's no doubt about it. Okay. Thank you. So it is on the list. Okay. Anything else for John? Seeing none. Thank you, John. You're um, welcome. Next on the agenda, I need to make a little bit of a change. You've still got Gary Seipel listed as the Highway Committee Chair. Uh, Gary has retired from the County Board, so it's gone forever. Um, but I'd like to introduce Kelly McCullough, who is the Chair of the Highway Committee now. And Kelly, you're up if you'd like to say anything. Hi, folks. Um, yeah, I'm, I am in fact new enough that you've got the, still got the Gary Seipel on the list. So uh, John has covered pretty, pretty much everything I would uh, would say. Hopefully I will have more next time around after I've had a chance to process this meeting and think about how best to add to it. Anything else? Any questions for Kelly? You wanna know, uh, I wanna know where his cat is today. <laughs> a couple of them have been wandering through. Um, okay. <laughs> I keep uh, eyeballing in his chair. So yeah, that, looks, that looks pretty comfortable. That's what I keep thinking too. I got to get a better chair if we're going to do Zoom meetings all the time. Um, next on the agenda, the Menominee Police Department. Somebody here from Menominee Police? Don't see anybody. Wisconsin State Patrol. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, we can. Okay. Um, Sergeant Andrews Bell, Wisconsin State Patrol. Um, just a report in this construction zone. We haven't had any real major issues. Um, pretty much the response from our troopers and uh, FST trucks have been handling things pretty good and getting things opened up pretty well. Um, we don't have any troopers dedicated directly in the zone right now. I believe once we get to that 3 1 split with the, the traffic lane split up, then we will start having a, a dedicated trooper in there. Um, also, one of our motor officers is hopefully getting his motorcycle here the next week or so. So he'll be able to do a lot more enforcement in there uh, throughout the day on his own. Um, we started doing scheduling our guys for some predictive analytic shifts. So they'll be going off of the hot zones and the community maps and look in some areas and they'll spend, depending on where they choose that day, we'll kind of hang out in that area for the majority of their, of their shift or like a five to 10 mile radius of that general area. Uh, what else? We are also doing click it or ticket starting up here next week, I believe. So we'll have some of that enforcement going on. Um, and as well as now that things are kind of going back, somewhat back to normal with our enforcement efforts with COVID, 
kind of dying down the area. We're going to be doing a lot more enforcement with our ASU in our plane with some more aggressive driving and uh, ASU uh, speed detail as well. Um, the site also OWI stuff, we're doing a lot more enforcement with that. We've seen during the past couple months, uh, the, a lot of those high, high speed uh, incidents we've had with people driving during the day thinking that law enforcement isn't out there. Um, we've been seeing a lot of OWI arrests with high speed. So we're kind of getting out there and we're going to be scheduling some more guys more in the 6 to 3 a.m. hours to kind of hopefully increase that OVI enforcement in and around uh, Menominee and Dunn County. Um, and that's kind of all I have. Anybody have any questions for the Highway Patrol? Seeing none, we're moving right along. Uh, Wisconsin DNR, anybody here? I didn't see anybody on the list. Nobody here from DNR. School administrators. Bill, I think that's you. Yes, good morning. I'd unmute there. Uh, Bill Yinks, uh, School District Colfax Superintendent. I guess I'm the Dunn County uh, School Representative. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, in Colfax specifically, we've been working on an LED crossing guard light project, which we started last summer. The village is going to complete that. I think very soon I see the poles are up and uh, hopefully that's going to make it a lot safer for our kids uh, crossing uh, to the school each day. It's the real bright uh, LED lights like you see in Menominee down near UW Stout in a few places. Uh, the only other thing that I could think of that might pertain, and it's kind of an unknown at this point, but due to COVID, um, we're not sure what's going to happen in the fall as far as uh, the starting of school and, you know, we know the social distancing guidelines, that type of thing. But the only thing I could think of would be um, an increase in transportation if uh, schools can't haul the number of students that we are used to hauling in a normal setting, i.e. if we have to reduce the numbers in order to social distance, that might mean more bus um, loops, more buses on the road for longer periods of time. So um, other than that, I don't have anything else. Any questions for me? Thank you, Bill. I uh, don't see any questions, but uh, I wish you well in trying to resume school activities in the fall. That's got to be a real challenge. Oh, thank you. Uh, Dunn County Board Representative, Gary? I don't have anything to present. I'll just introduce myself, Gary Steen. I'm a County Board Rep, an interested party. Uh, and uh, just to go along with what Bill said, I'm also on the village board in Colfax. Uh, should be done this week, Bill, I hope. Any questions for the county board rep? Uh, emergency medical services, uh, Red Cross. Nobody from the Red Cross, Red Cedar Medical Center. Mary, that's you. Yes, good morning. Um, I guess I'm new to this committee, so I'm learning um, a lot about a lot of things that I didn't anticipate learning. So are you able to hear me okay? Okay. We can hear you uh, fine, thank you. Great, okay. Um, I guess I would just update a little bit on um, COVID-19 testing and results. Um, my numbers are primarily for the Northwest Wisconsin region, which includes um, Barron, Osseo, uh, Bloomer, Eau Claire and Menominee. Um, and these are results, or these are test data as of last night. Um, so we've completed 13,519 total COVID-19 tests. We've had 186 positives, 21 indeterminate, meaning we aren't able to determine if they're, if they're positive or negative. We have had 14 positive employees in our region, um, but we've tested 926. We have had um, 134 total patients tested positive. And from a Menominee perspective, we have had zero patients hospitalized in the Menominee Hospital with, who are COVID positive. From an employee standpoint, um, we are continuing to do universal masking, employee and patient and visitor, um, continuing to do universal masking and screening, social distancing, um, no self-service food, any of those kinds of things. Um, we still have some visitor limitations 
and asking employees to self-monitor for signs and symptoms. We are starting uh, serology testing for all employees to determine if they have the antibiotic, antibody. That'll be starting next week in Eau Claire and the following week in Menominee. Um, it's an, a voluntary test, so any employee who is interested in, in finding out um, is welcome to take that test for free. So I think that'll be a good thing in terms of trying to get people to also donate plasma um, and contribute then to a, um, a vaccine going forward. Um, let's see, we are testing all of our inpatients for COVID and we are testing all of our surgical procedures prior to surgery to try to minimize the risk of spreading COVID in our, in our organization. Um, we did a recent tabletop exercise on surge planning. So all of our, all of our locations have had a surge plan in terms of how do we, how many patients can we take care of from a respiratory perspective? Um, and we've, we've done a lot of work on how we, we might do that in our physical environment as well as our staffing. And so we had an exercise here about last week and that was a, a really good opportunity for us to just to really think about um, if there's a surge in COVID patients in Menominee, who in our region could help us out? If there's a surge in Eau Claire, how might Rochester help us out and how might we collaborate with our other community partners? So that was a good exercise. Um, in addition, I think uh, this group may be interested that we are going to be starting to have security presence on our campus. Six out of 14 days, um, That's a, it's a start. We're getting a 1.0 FTE for each of our campuses throughout the Northwest Wisconsin region. So we'll have some daytime presence and some nighttime presence. Um, but I think that's just a really good opportunity for um, those security folks to interact with our local law enforcement. And we've been incredibly appreciative of our local law enforcement and their responsiveness and support whenever we've had a patient situation or a visitor situation. Um, but I think this will just um, aid, to, aid to our staff feeling more secure and safe in our environment. I think that's all for my report. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Mary. I don't see any questions. Okay. And is this the kind of information that you'd like to hear or is there something else that you would be interested in hearing from the medical center? Uh, this was very useful to me personally and as a, a county board member, I uh, can't speak for the others, but one of the advantages of having this live streamed and then recorded for YouTube is we have a chance to go back and look at the whole meeting again, look at the uh, uh, PowerPoint slides, look at the information that people have presented. So uh, if anybody has suggestions, and I include myself in that for me or anyone, uh, be very much interested in hearing about them. Because uh, Mary, as you are, I'm brand new to this. I didn't know the committee existed until I found out I was chair. <laughs> I'll, I'll second Jim. That was very useful information for me as well. Good. Thank you. Um, public health, KT, I see you somewhere. Yep, there you are. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I also have a slide deck that I can share for folks that are interested in the data. I feel like um, I am doing all COVID all the time. So I just would give a, a COVID update if you guys are interested and we can just um, kind of skim through the information building off of what Mary had shared. I would also say that um, the data that she provided uh, does include some duplicative testing. So we have seen that um, some folks are being retested prior to returning to work. So just because you have the number of positives that she put out, it doesn't mean that we actually have that many cases. So I just wanted to temper that, that um, information with a little bit of detail. So this slide deck is actually from my Health and Human Services Board meeting from last night. So some of the data is a little outdated, but I think that it gives maybe just a different slice of um, information associated with the, the metrics that I'm, I'm looking at. Um, we have heard from the state that they are gonna put a data portal out for us um, next week. Uh, they've been working on it for over a month now. And so it's gonna help the public really follow along at home with the, the different quantitative data that I look at regularly uh, when I'm assessing the epidemiology and um, healthcare capacity as well as public health capacity to uh, keep up with, with COVID-19 in Dunn County. Um, so just to start, um, 
our numbers. We have been really in, in the data in here. I do need to, to double check that this is, um, I believe, two days old. So the numbers for Wisconsin have updated. We did have um, a fair number of cases yesterday and a, a increase in our percent positive to almost 4% um, out of those cases in Wisconsin. But again, Dunn County is holding steady at 29 cases. We're really lucky. We are working several disease um, clusters that are just outside our county borders right now. So we have contact investigations associated with workplaces um, that do live in Dunn County. So we are doing that work. Um, looking at case counts, again, this is a couple days old. Eau Claire is almost 150 now. I think they're at 149 as of yesterday. Um, Trempolo is at 85. Again, Trempolo has a, a workplace outbreak that has made it so that they have doubled cases very, very quickly. Um, La Crosse is at almost 200 cases as well. And that's not necessarily in our um, my normal slide deck, but it's important to know. We also look at the, the burden of disease. So as a rate, again, Dunn County is holding really pretty steady, which is, which is fantastic. Um, it also indicates, uh, it is an indicator of whether or not the local public health department can keep up with the cases. So that's helpful. Um, but just so you guys can see, we're doing pretty well. Trajectory or trends, this is another thing that I look at. How quickly are we doubling or the RO of um, cases? And this is just a quick progression. Um, you can see in two week increments what we're seeing. Again, Dunn County is holding fairly steady. We have had um, adjacent counties that have not been that lucky. Again, associated with um, some large workplace um, facility investigations, as well as um, in La Crosse County, they're looking at more social exposures. So our cases, again, this is a couple days old. Um, I, we are starting to increase as a region, um, something that I watch very closely. ILI is a measure, it's a proxy measure that I've talked about before. It's part of the Badger Bounce Back program, one of their gating criteria. So for folks that aren't being tested for COVID, there is a way to, to kind of capture what those illnesses um, might be. So that's influenza or COVID-like illness as they present to the emergency department or urgent care. And so we're able to get that data from our hospital partners and then track it. Testing, this is another measure. We wanna make sure that we are testing at a significant level to know that our data is accurate. So um, Badger Bounce Back and the state has uh, encouraged us to, take, to test about 625 people a week in Dunn County to be reflective of their 85,000 tests a week in the state. Um, so, we were seeing a significant uptick in testing and there's some rationale behind that. So the state had a statewide initiative to do baseline testing in all of our long-term care facilities. We did that from the 27th to the 6th. So you can see that that really increased our numbers of testing. Um, now that we have made it through that baseline testing, we have seen a reduction. So we are gonna do continue to do some outreach to make sure that folks that are symptomatic are getting tested, that there aren't barriers or undue barriers to testing for, again, symptomatic folks. The CDC just updated their guidance on testing asymptomatic. And so I imagine that many of our health system partners will um, hear more from folks that are asymptomatic but care to be tested. Um, and I do know that some of our health system partners are accommodating that request. Hospital capabilities. This is another metric that you can follow along on the state website about total beds as well as ICU beds, um, recognizing that when you look at a region, our region is all that in teal. Um, it might not be reasonable for us to, to travel up to the Superior Duluth area to make use of, of some of their beds. So really what we're looking at are the ICU beds really in kind of this area as well as in the Twin City Metro in Rochester. Healthcare capacity, again, this is a metric that I'm um, following very closely. Are we able to prevent secondary transmission by doing disease 
um, case follow-up. So after we get a positive, we've got 24 hours to make contact with them, identify all of their close contacts. That's everybody within six feet for more than 15 minutes, and then be able to follow up with that entire list within an additional 24 hours. And so right now we're, we're handling that very well, um, recognizing that when you have a large workplace or when you have a group of folks that are um, partying together, then those numbers of contact investigations can go up significantly and it can really be a barrier to following up on that. So for, like I said, La Crosse had um, yesterday, they had 22 new cases in one day. So that makes it a, a real challenge to um, not only do all the contact investigations within 48 hours, but do the disease investigations within 24. These are the same recommendations that I've had literally since we started, um, wanting to make sure that we keep our circles small, small, that we are maintaining physical distance, we are maintaining good hand hygiene, both good hand washing, uh, using hand sanitizer, respiratory hygiene, coughing into your elbow, wearing face coverings. Um, if you are at all sick, that you are staying home uh, and that you are limiting the travel that you do to just those um, things that you need to do. We are continuing to see in the region travel as a risk factor, um, not with our Dunn County cases, but within regional cases. And then you guys have seen this graphic. Um, just as I talk about moving things incrementally, this is what I'm talking about, um, turning the dial. And so when with workplace settings, so places like big box stores, places like um, offices, people are typically able to maintain physical distance in a different way than they would necessarily in social gatherings. So there is a significant difference between the two types of settings. Um, and so, no, not everybody, I'm not a hugger, but there's just no way I would hug somebody in a workplace setting. I think HR has something to say about that. Um, but then in those social settings that might have that closer proximity for physical touch. Um, any questions on any of that? Hey, Tay, do you, do you anticipate, um, or what do you anticipate for guidance for like uh, golf courses and places to host larger events and the, them serving food? What, what do you kind of anticipate for the summer for that? Sure. So at this point, the health alert that I put out, they are recommendations, they are not orders. Um, and so if you were to be in Eau Claire where they have a, a, an actual order that's enforceable, that is different than what we have here. So my recommendations really are based on that incremental step of can we handle the cases we have from a public health capacity standpoint? What does our burden of disease look like here and in the region? and how capable are hospitals to handle that kind of um, slow burn of cases. And so I would like to increase the size of outdoor gatherings and indoor gatherings incrementally based on our data, um, but it's really going to be data informed. Um, so I wish I had a, a, a crystal ball. I think if I could predict the, the future, I'd be making a lot more money doing something else, um, but uh, I hope to be able to incrementally increase that. That being said, I've worked with a lot of different municipalities and different businesses on how to reduce harm associated with wanting to continue to do the work that they do. Um, and so that could be long, um, elongating the route to a parade, or that could be um, talking through concessions at an event or talking through um, um, how to limit congregations um, spread of disease within faith communities. And so um, I, my, my caution for um, wedding planners and for big events is that if they do it, they need to follow the WEDIC guidelines on doing it safer. They need to have um, some really good, not only screening for their employees, but encouragement of screening for their participants. And again, all those same things about hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, um, and then physical distancing. Because with wedding gatherings, with retirement parties, there is that, um, that drive to be close to one another. And I think that's where we're seeing the real risk of transmission, not only with being in somebody else's breathing zone, 
but also with physical touch. Thank you. Katie, uh, what kind of assistance do you have to draw on for contact tracing if it gets beyond what your staff can handle? Sure, so that's a great question. Um, right now, La Crosse has the state supporting them with contact tracing. And so there are state hired contact tracers um, and that they have run through kind of a, a training boot camp, not only to use WEDS, our Wisconsin Electronic Disease Surveillance System, but also the ins and outs of, of having very sensitive conversations with people that may not want to tell you about all the folks they've been in contact with, um, let alone answer their phone. So it, it, is a, it is a support that we have from the state. Their, um, their support, of course, they, they don't know the community like we know the community. And so sometimes that's a barrier. And then additionally, they don't have the ability to do the case monitoring. So after um, the state will do the, the contact investigations or the disease investigations, and it comes back to the local to make sure that there are no barriers to that individual case to actually stay put. And so we have had cases within the region and then locally um, that were a significant challenge. So within the population that's homeless or the population that chooses to use drugs, there can be some significant um, impacts to keeping them where they're supposed to be and not exposing other people. That takes daily monitoring in person. And so that's not something that the state can do for us, but it is something that we are required to do, of course, to keep this, the community safe. So they'd be the first call, National Guard or anything like that, have they been utilized for this kind of stuff? So I have not heard of National Guard to come in to do any kind of disease, um, either quarantine and isolation um, guards or, or, or that. We have, um, sorry. No, I meant um, more of the contact tracing investigative. Right, right, right. That's not been used then? So the guard has not been used for that. So the guard has come in to support us with testing. And so um, many of the large employment-based outbreaks have had guard support for comprehensive testing. I believe that we will have the guard in the region um, early next week to do a workplace in the region, um, but they do not do contact tracing or any kind of isolation or quarantine guarding. Okay, thanks. Uh, KT, this, this is Gary here. Uh, I just gave blood this week and uh, the Red Cross is, is uh, testing for uh, COVID antibiotics uh, automatically. I didn't know that and, and they, they will only let me know if, if they found them. So I thought point of information for anybody interested in giving blood. No, that's a fantastic point. The Red Cross did just um, earlier this week let everybody know that they will be antibody testing all donators so that, um, again, I think to Mary Biggs' point, we can identify where there is a possibility for convalescent therapies um, and folks that may want to donate plasma otherwise to help um, provide treatments or what are proving to be promising treatments for COVID-19. Is there anything else for KT, for public health? So I did think um, it would be prudent to give you guys an update on our Ridgeland testing. So at the last meeting, I had shared with you guys that we were doing a systematic testing of well water after we found a uranium exceedance in one of the, the wells. And so we have completed that testing. We did have one exceedance in a non-household application so they have chosen to redrill, um, and we have not gotten the results of that uh, testing back, but uh, it was really good to see that we didn't have widespread uranium exceedances in people's drinking water. Did you, did you say uranium or did I miss her that? No, it was uranium. So um, yes, so we had, um, uh, apartment complex test um, and have an exceedance in uranium. Um, uranium is, I know people really consider it for it's kind of that shock value around its radioactive properties, but it has an incredibly long 
half-life. So it's not something that we're really worried about in the body from a radioactive standpoint, but it does act in the body like a heavy metal. And there are toxicities associated with that. So um, we did do uh, widespread testing and we're really grateful to find that uh, it is related probably to, so the DNRs, again, there was a hydrogeologist, people much smarter than I am, that really looked at kind of where they believe those fissures are. Um, uranium is in our bedrock. We know that because we have radon, which is a, a, dis, a byproduct of, of uranium. Um, but along those fissures, if your well goes into a fissure, you might have um, an increased risk. And so some of our deeper wells in the community along those fissure lines, um, so again, not a, a household well, which tend to be a little sh more shallow, but um, the apartment complex and then the, the store um, did have exceedances. Fascinating. Um, anything else, Katie? No, sir. Any other, any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Uh, up next, uh, unfortunate choice of words here, disasters, Melissa Gillenbach. Yeah, thank you. Um, I really don't have any um, disasters to report on. You know, we've been trying to help with the COVID front. Um, I think mostly here in emergency management, we have been working with um, PPE and helping uh, people maintain or um, be able to source some PPE that they need um, to help fight on the COVID front lines. So that's been, a, you know, probably our main focus. Um, like I said, no disasters or anything like that. Um, just the normal day-to-day -day business and then COVID. Any questions for Melissa? Since there are no disasters, that's a pretty short report. That's always good news. Um, next up, uh, highway traffic safety. Scott, you're back. Sorry for the delay, the delay there. I have nothing further. All right. Anybody have any questions for Scott? Seeing none, we will go to the uh, fire department. Uh, Andy, are you still with us? Yes, this is uh, Andy Bendred, Menominee Fire Department. Don't have a whole lot to add um, other than initially when all this COVID stuff started, our call volume dropped significantly as much as 25% compared to the previous year. Uh, right now we're about down about 15%. So we're starting to pick up um, in some instances people will claim that they weren't going to the hospitals, even though they maybe should have because they didn't want to because of COVID. So we're starting to see calls now that um, people have been waiting to go to the hospital. Now they call an ambulance. Um, a lot of our policies and procedures have changed a little bit just to deal with these patients. Um, we're sitting good with PPE. We've had a lot of help and guidance from other organizations and people. Um, and we have not had anyone test positive. None of our paramedics have tested positive for COVID. So I feel pretty fortunate with that. And that's about it. Does anyone have questions? Don't see any questions. Um, anybody else have anything for Andy? If not, uh, we'll get to part G, which is UW Extension. Sure, thank you. Uh, Katie Wontok, UW Extension here in Dunn County. And my role on the committee is to provide an update on agriculture here in Dunn County. So I serve as the agriculture educator, have been for uh, going on 10 years. And so uh, with farming here in Dunn County, obviously uh, we are 
about three, almost four weeks ahead of progress on crop planting as compared to last year. So that's good news, less equipment uh, still on the roads. So we've moved into, um, you know, continuing to do some nitrogen applications on crops as uh, well as moving on to hay. And so there are still uh, some, you know, traffic on the roads as far as uh, tractors, but uh, everybody is not rushing to get those things done. So. Hopefully we'll continue to see nice timely rains and the crops will progress. Um, you know, uh, KT has provided quite a bit of updates on, on COVID, certainly affecting agriculture. Uh, as you've heard in the news, some meatpacking plants were impacted, uh, not necessarily in Dunn County, but we have seen a, an uptick in our local processing plants, taking in additional animals that maybe weren't able to go to some of those larger plants uh, across the border. And uh, so they are extremely busy around uh, those uh, meat processors. Um, concern there, of course, for employees in, in close proximity. Um, and speaking of employees, some of our larger dairy farms that we have in the county, um, they continue to make sure and ensure safety of their employees as they work quite closely together uh, when on their farm. So uh, the other concept uh, regarding COVID, you know, farmers are typically, um, you know, social distancing already, uh, just kind of the nature of, of farming and, and the work that they do. But um, because of some of the struggles we have seen in commodity prices, especially dairy going on almost uh, five years now, uh, real uptick in concern of mental health with some of our farmers and a lot of the ag professionals that work with those farmers. So um, several colleagues and I are working on some larger USDA grants and applying for funding to start work on uh, some new curriculum that would um, try and encourage mental health uh, awareness and training of ag professionals that work with those farmers and getting those resources uh, to farmers. Uh, the Wisconsin Farm Center is a great resource. They have seen certainly in the last six months an uptick in calls um, and requesting vouchers to go see uh, mental health professionals. And in rural Wisconsin, we really struggle to have the number of rural um, those professionals in rural Wisconsin. So uh, that grant would also supply some additional funds uh, to help uh, that resource. So um, those are what we're kind of seeing in agriculture right now. There's lots of Wisconsin as well as USDA support programs where farmers are um, looking for additional funds to help offset some of those low prices that they uh, be uh, as a result of COVID. And uh, so con extension continuing to work with those farmers on filling out those applications. Um, any questions? Uh, Scott here. I'm just questioning what the dairy farmers are doing. Are they getting rid of 100% of their milk right now or what's happening with that? Yeah, we, uh, as a result of COVID, you know, there was a, an issue with the, obviously the demand. Um, uh, some of those that uh, sold directly into restaurants saw their demand uh, significantly decrease. Uh, milk that went into schools. And so there was a, certainly a drop. There was some dumping, not necessarily in our area, but there was some request of farmers to reduce production, including some uh, buyouts actually of, of herds. So we did see a spike in farmer retirements, uh, selling off of herds and reduction in, in dairy cattle. Uh, that has kind of uh, almost shifted considerably the supply with restaurants and coming back on a lot of people, you know, June dairy month that we're currently in the thick of uh, uptick in dairy products. So actually we've seen a, an almost uh, $7 swing in our class three commodity prices for dairy farmers. Um, um, anticipating that a level off here in a few months, but uh, we have not seen dumping. We've seen a reduction in herd. And uh, so I believe the creameries are back up to full capacity. There was a uh, transition in some of the products that they are doing, but uh, overall seeing, you know, back to somewhat normal, at least from the dairy production side. Okay, thank you. I would just note Pepin County is doing their dairy breakfast as a drive-through dairy breakfast. If people are interested, they can Google that. It's free and you can go and pick up your breakfast. Basically, it's not made for you, but all the ingredients are there. Yes, uh, last weekend would have been Dunn County's dairy breakfast, uh, which was canceled, will be rescheduled to the same location in the town of Grant uh, in 2021. Uh, they, um, Dunn County's committee is instead using those proceeds to increase dairy products availability at uh, local food pantries throughout the county.
Anything else for Katie? Thank you, Katie. Nice to sit in on a meeting with you again. It's been a few years. Um, that concludes the report section. Uh, item number seven on the agenda. Uh, are there any committee concerns, unfinished business to deal with? The chair has nothing to uh, put on the agenda. Any committee concerns? Um, our next meeting is scheduled for September 18th, 2020, 9 a.m. Um, it's impossible to guess whether we'll meet live and in person or on Zoom. We'll just have to wait and see. Uh, in the meantime, though, I'd like to thank uh, Krista Vind for the IT support. I want to thank John Swarski for co-hosting the meeting. I want to thank uh, uh, Patty Kenny for taking care of the minutes and the paperwork. And I want to thank all of you for participating. You know, it struck me a few minutes ago, I guess, finally, that I wish the general public uh, could sit in and watch some of this and get some better idea of the kind of people that are working on their behalf day in, day out, difficult circumstances. So thanks to all of you, not only for your participation today, but for your ongoing efforts. Uh, it's inspirational to me. Um, any other announcements? If not, oh, Gary. No. Oh. I just want to wish everyone to stay well. Thank you. I would uh, echo that statement. All right. Then uh, seeing no other business, we are adjourned. Thank you, folks.